So the thalamus, uh, definitely in uh, medical schools uh, around the country, gets swept under the rug uh, when details are needed. And in most neurosurgical residencies, uh, it gets uh, somewhat uh, passed over. Uh, the details are lacking. So what I'd like to do is give some of the essential qualities of the anatomy of the thalamus and then uh, uh, conclude with that and try to get us back on schedule. The Greek word thalamus just means chamber. Um, sometimes people refer to the inner chamber. It's at the depths or the central core of the brain. Um, even in modern day, modern day language in Greek, when you ask about a patient's room or chamber, you use the word thalamus, so it's still in modern uh, usage. As Dr. Rebus showed you, showed you earlier, the thalamus uh, sits atop the brainstem, uh, and many people will consider it, uh, you know, as uh, a part of that system. Necessarily, it's there. Um, it's less primitive than the brainstem and helps to relay that information up to the neocortex. A very simplistic drawing that shows you the parts. So, in uh, the yellow color, we see the caudate. Uh, swinging it back posteriorly with its tail and uh, capping its tail is the amygdala. We see uh, up front in uh, a purple color, this is uh, representative of uh, the butamen. And then in a little darker purple, just posterior to that, we see globus pallidus. And then finally, the positioning of where the thalamus would be uh, from the side. So the thalamus uh, has uh, thousands and thousands of little connections. We'll make it very simplified with this talk. This uh, little schematic just gives you a small sampling of how complex these uh, connections are. Uh, so everything that's uh, below the level of the thalamus has to enter the thalamus, and then um, it's um, projected up to the cortex. Uh, as Dr. Rebus mentioned to you earlier, the olfactory system is one um, part of the anatomy that doesn't make it to the thalamus, it bypasses it. In general, if you look at these thalamic projections, so thalamus here in the center of the picture, um, these projections from the thalamus, so thalamocortical fibers, travel up to the cortex and those will terminate usually in the fourth layer of the cerebral cortex. And then reciprocally, the fibers from the cortex will go back to the same part of the thalamus. They do generally don't skip around and go to alternative areas. So a reciprocal connection from the cortex back to that same thalamic nuclei that it projected up to will come from not layer four, but usually layer six, sometimes layer five of the cortex and then back down. Most of these neurotransmitters being used that are projecting up onto the thalamus are glutamate, uh, if you looked at um, ratios, and then most of the neurotransmitters from the thalamus up to the cortex are using GABA. So those are the two main neurotransmitter systems that we find. I just was mentioned earlier, if you look at the uh, embryology of where the uh, thalamus comes from, it comes from the diencephalon, right? And the diencephalon, as you know very well, comes from the um, prosencephalon. So prosencephalon gives rise to telencephalon and diencephalon. Anything that has thalamus in its name is going to be represented in the diencephalon, right? So we have thalamus, and within thalamus, we talk about a ventral and a dorsal thalamus. So the dorsal thalamus is what most people equate to thalamus. The ventral thalamus, as I'll show you in a minute, includes things like the zona inserta, subthalamic nucleus, the fields of Farrell. Okay, so we'll just briefly talk about that. Um, other parts of the uh, thalamus, uh, and again, this would be the uh, dorsal thalamus. We have the subthalamus, we have, which some people will include as a separate system. We have the posterior um, part of the pituitary, right? the infundibulum, the optic, optic apparatus. Then we have the epithalamus, right? pineal gland. Some people will throw in there the posterior commissure, and then the habenula and the habenular commissure. So all those parts. Um, equating to derivations of the diencephalon. Where does the uh, adenohypophysis come from? Because I didn't mention that. Anterior pituitary. So it's an ectodermal derived structure from the back of the pharynx. Remember Rathke's uh, pouch, that's where it's uh, derived from. So a beautiful uh, picture, compliments of Dr. Roten. Uh, and if you've read his textbook, this is uh, what is uh, placed on the cover. And this very nicely shows you a medial projection. This is not compatible with life, obviously. Uh, so uh, from an anatomical viewpoint only, we see the thalamus here, somewhat in the center. It's kind of uh, covered up 
um, nicely by the fornix, right, which we see here. And as again, Dr. Rebus showed you this morning, if you draw kind of a line between the frame in Monroe and then back towards the cerebral aqueduct, that line or the hypothalamic sulcus is what divides the diencephalon and basically separates the alar from the basal plates during development. Thalamus being derived mostly from um, the portion that gives rise to the sensory function in those plates. Uh, so hypothalamic sulcus, hypothalamus, uh, we see the thalamus itself, and here a, a large mass intermedia, and I'll mention that a little bit uh, in a moment. Pineal gland, let me see related to the pineal gland. What's this vein? Vein of Galen, right? Just underneath the splenium. Basal vein, excuse me, internal cerebral vein. Then just above pineal, we see the habenula, right? Habenula commissure. We then see below that posterior commissure, and then the tectum. If you look at a dorsal view of the quote-unquote dorsal thalamus, we see uh, some interesting relationships. Remember that the thalami are rotated about 30 degrees off the midline, right? So you see the posterior part where the pulvinar is as protruding more laterally. Uh, the anterior part of the thalamus here is referred to as the anterior tubercle of the thalamus, and that points and forms the posterior wall of the frame of Monroe. Anterior wall, uh, as you heard this morning, of the frame of Monroe is represented by the column of the fornix. If we look at this area, we'll see that there's an ependymal uh, coating on top of the thalamus. Remember the thalamus uh, forming the walls of the third ventricle. And then as we uh, move uh, over laterally, you'll see a small groove between the caudate, right? Remember the head of the caudate that we see here in the lateral ventricles, body, and then going back toward the tail. And just lateral to that, we see the internal capsule. This little groove uh, is represented um, between the thalamus and the caudate, and within it carries the thalamal striate vein, right? It also carries the stria terminalis that's deep to that uh, vein. The stria terminalis, remember, connects fibers from the hypothalamus in the front and then takes those posteriorly toward what structure? Amygdala. So hypothalamus to amygdala is a stria terminalis. Stria medullaris, that uh, our residents will get confused uh, with stria terminalis, runs more medially. You can see a little hint of it here running on just on the medial surface of the thalamus. That also runs from the hypothalamus, but then connects posteriorly with the habenula. So habenula um, also with some connections up front in addition to the hypothalamus to the anterior part of the thalamus itself. Here are the columns, again, of the fornix as a representation and the pineal gland in the midline. If you looked at a, a real sagittal section of the brain, you would see uh, here's the mass intermedia, right? Mass intermedia is more commonly, it's about 80% of the population has one. It's more common in females. It's bigger in females. Function is unknown. Uh, it can be a barrier when you're, doing, when you're doing endoscopic third ventriculostomies and you look in and there's a bridge across the uh, third ventricle. And then as a, a board exam question, it's usually enlarged in what population? Spina bifida. So neural tube defects will usually give you an enlarged mass intermedia. That can be spina bifida or occipital, excuse me, or encephalocils in general. So uh, stria medullaris, we see just above that, right on the midline, habenula and connecting anteriorly to the anterior thalamus and uh, the hypothalamus. Here we see uh, the hypothalamus, right? So we're below the hypothalamic sulcus running from the cerebral aqueduct to the frame of Monroe. So all hypothalamus. In uh, a cross section, we see very nicely all things that are thalamic are here. We see the internal capsule in this dark, uh, darker color. Then we see the GPI, GPE, pulvinar, and a little bit of the claustrum. And then it's a hint of the insular cortex. Some other things just to orient you as to where the section is. This is uh, the third cranial nerve. Oh, you, my uh, pointer is not as big as it is on my screen, sorry. Third cranial nerve down here in the far left. Sorry about that. Optic apparatus uh, just here. Uh, we see the mammillary body, right? And the mammillary body is part of what? Hypothalamus. And extending from that mammillary body, we see two black extensions, right? 
the more familiar one, the tract of Vic d'Azur, or the mammalothalamic tract that travels from mammillary body up to the anterior nucleus and is part of PAPE circuitry, right, that then projects up to the cingulate gyrus. And then we see the mammalotegmental fibers that come off more laterally and give us a key in to structures of the ventral thalamus, including the uh, zona inserta and the subthalamic nucleus. A more uh, surgically oriented picture is shown here, so intraventricularly. If we uh, move that forward, we see some veins coming together, uh, veins of the anterior caudate. We see the vein of the, we don't see it, but it's hiding underneath this choroid plexus, the vein of the stria terminalis. Those two form our thalamostriate vein, which is a landmark in any intraventricular uh, procedure that you do. And as we move forward, thalamostriate vein joins with this vein. What is this vein here? Septal vein. So septal vein plus thalamostriate vein come together at the uh, internal angle, and that marks the posterior portion of the frame of Monroe. And uh, at that point, you become the internal cerebral veins posteriorly. Here, there's been removal. If we went back one slide, you'd see that this midline septum pellucidum with its attached fornix has been pulled up posteriorly, shown here. And we see nicely an exposure of the roof of the third ventricle. So the walls of the third ventricle being the thalami, roof being this uh, conjoined piece of uh, fornix with uh, septum pellucidum, but more so this uh, cobwebby material, which is what? Velum interpositum. So it's one of the leaves of the velum interpositum. And within those leaves of the velum interpositum, in the next slide, you see running the internal cerebral veins, right, back toward the vein of Galen under the splenium posteriorly. And then uh, also within the velum interpositum, what arteries run there? Which one? Posterior medial choroidal. So posterior medial choroidals and the basal veins run within the velum interpositum. Uh, as we then move those apart, we see down into the third ventricle. So third ventricle, we see the pineal gland. And then what is this just uh, anterior to the pineal gland that's bridging from left to right sides? Posterior commissure. Good. Uh, posterior view. So we've seen medial views. We've seen dorsal views of the dorsal thalamus. Now, if we look at uh, an upside down view, this being tectum here, cerebral aqueduct in the middle. Uh, over here, we see an extension of the posterior aspect of the thalamus that protrudes behind the third ventricle and uh, extends posterior to the tectum. And this is the pulvinar. So pulvinar is seen here nicely. Pulvinar, as we'll see, and someone I think mentioned in the last talk, um, not uh, given a blood supply by the posterior medial choroidal, but given a blood supply by the posterior lateral choroidal artery as it crosses off the P2 segment of the posterior cerebral artery traveling laterally. Now, nothing to do with the thalamus, but surgically uh, oriented question is, this is the ambient cistern, right? Correct, just lateral to the midbrain. And we see three main things, the fourth cranial nerve extending uh, in the area of the pulvinar, we see the basal vein of Rosenthal, and then we see the posterior cerebral artery. So those three structures, main components of uh, ambient cistern uh, and nicely viewed from this picture. Midline sagittal uh, that shows you a beautiful septal vein uh, coming down and joining with the thalamostriate. We see uh, a nice depiction here uh, in the middle of the massa intermedia, and then very uh, nicely displayed uh, the wall of the hypothalamus. Uh, optic apparatus, optic nerve. So dorsal thalamus, uh, and uh, the next few slides are necessary evils when you talk about the thalamus. Uh, you don't see these surgically, but uh, uh, they're important if you're going to be stimulating the area, removing tumors from the area, uh, or taking your boards, right? So dorsal thalamus, you can uh, very simply, and this is a easy way, the thalamus, they're textbooks written just on the thalamus. and. Um, some people will divide it up into more than 50 different subnuclei. Um, we're going to divide it into the more commonly used nuclei. Anterior nuclei, again, these are uh, associated with your limbic system. Uh, medial nuclei, uh, lots of lateral nuclei. And uh, one uh, small thing I'll bring to you is of these lateral nuclei, we have uh, ventral anterior, ventral lateral. We have ventral posterior lateral, lateral dorsal, lateral posterior posterior and pulvinar. Uh, the 
uh, thing to remember is that some people, uh, and if you pick up 100 books on the thalamus, 50 will use it and 50 will not, talk about a ventral intermediate nucleus, and people get confused, what is the ventral intermediate nucleus? And all that is, based on different interpretations, the small area that's either the ventral lateral caudalis or it's a part of the oralis VPL, uh, one or the other. So it's interposed between those two areas. Midline nuclei, uh, these are not talked about as much. Uh, and one reason is we have no idea what they really do. Uh, so the peritoneal nucleus, nucleus limitans, and the nucleus uh, reunions are all small midline nuclei. Interlaminar nuclei, which have gained some attention in recent years, largest one is the central median nucleus. Uh, we have central lateral, central medial, paracentral, parafascicular. Reticular nuclei, so if you look at the thalamus in general, it's coated with an external medullary lamina, and then running somewhat down the middle of it is an internal medullary lamina. That internal medullary lamina anteriorly forks, and between the two parts of the fork is where you have the anterior nucleus. The external medullary lamina is a um, capsule, and just outside of that capsule is where your reticular nuclei live. So if someone asks you, the reticular activating system runs from where to where, it runs from the medulla, pons, midbrain, and then up to the lateral aspects of the thalamus. Okay, so reticular nuclei, which interestingly, if you look at all of the thalamic nuclei, they don't communicate between each other, as best we know. So there's not a lot of internuclear um, communication, except the reticular nuclei that are on the periphery do communicate with all of those little intranuclear fibers. Metathalamus, who knows what the metathalamus is? It's an older name for the geniculate body. So the medial and lateral geniculate bodies are classified as metathalamus. This is a, a very simplified image, but shows you some of the main parts of the thalamus and then the subdivisions that we'll talk about on the left. Here's the internal medullary um, lamina, right, forking in the front. Everything lateral to that are lateral nuclei, lateral posterior, our VA, VL, VLP. Um, we don't see the V or the VLM is not labeled, but it's the darker green here. Uh, then uh, we see the pulvinar posteriorly and then our geniculate bodies. And you can see some of the inputs, and there are multiple inputs usually for each of these nuclei. Not just one thing goes to them in general. Uh, for example, the pulvinar is the, uh, leads the pack in having just about anything in the area that will project to pulvinar, and then um, for that will project back to those same areas. Uh, some more discrete areas, the VA nucleus gets a lot of uh, basal ganglia projections, especially from the uh, thalamic fasciculus that we'll talk about. Uh, the VL gets a lot of the deep cerebellar nuclei uh, projections. The dentato rubrothalamics project to this nucleus. Uh, VLP, as uh, most people remember, gets a lot of somatosensory, as in medial lumniscus. Spinal thalamic tracts go here from the body. BPM, we know those are mostly the ventral trigeminal thalamic tracts from the contralateral side of the body. Uh, the geniculates, auditory into the medial geniculate optic apparatus into the lateral. You know that very well. Now, those same areas then project up to some major cortical representation. So the anterior nuclei will project, as we mentioned, to the cingulate gyrus. The VA nucleus uh, will project to Brodmann area 8. Uh, VL nucleus, Brodmann 4. VL, VPL, Brodmann 312. VPM, Brodmann 43. Medial geniculate to Brodmann 41, 42 and then lateral geniculate, broad one seventeen. Now, why is all that important? Why do you need to know those little uh, subnuclei, many of which we have no idea what they even really do in humans? Well, as uh, some of the earlier presentations showed, um, pain can be uh, uh, controlled in some folks by stimulating the thalamus, especially VPL, VPM, depending if it's face or body. Dystonia tremor, uh, the ventral lateral nuclei uh, have been used for that. Epilepsy, as you just heard, uh, you can use uh, the anterior nucleus for a, a spot of Tourette's, the central median, um, and this has gained a little more popularity recently. OCD, the medial dorsal nucleus, has been stimulated for that. So that's uh, dorsal nucleus in a nutshell. You can't talk about that without at least mentioning the ventral nucleus, which they're confluent with each other, and these include the subthalamic nucleus, zona inserta, Fields of Pharrell, which uh, uh, our residents in Birmingham, they 
learn the night before the boards and then they never remember it until the next year. So uh, the fields of Pharrell are pretty simple. There's the H Pharrell, uh, H field, which is just the Ansel lenticularis. And I have two slides to show you this. Uh, H1 is the thalamic fasciculus that projects up to your VA nucleus. And then the H2 field is the lenticular nucleus. This is a, a cartoon uh, vis version, but we see the GPI, right? And GPI is what's going to have a significant input into the VA nucleus. And the way it gets to v the VA nucleus is by using this ventral thalamus. So we have ansel lenticularis that runs uh, way away from the subthalamic nucleus, lenticular fasciculus that runs between the subthalamic nucleus and the zona inserta. Uh, then we see that the lenticular nucleus, ansa lenticularis, and the dentato rubrothalamic tracts all come together to form the thalamic fasciculus, and that ends in the VA nucleus. Uh, one uh, side note is that the deep cerebellar fibers are coming contralaterally, right? Remember your superior cerebellar peduncle. And then our um, GPI fibers are from the same side. Here's a little uh, cleaner image shows some of those same fields of Pharrell. Uh, we see our ansa lenticularis that runs in front of the internal capsule. Uh, the uh, lenticular fasciculus runs through that posterior limb of the internal capsule. And we see then as we move out laterally, the H1 field, H2 field, and we see how they're interposed between Z, uh, zona inserta, subthalamic nucleus. Um, some will throw in this peducular pontine nucleus that's gotten a lot of uh, attention uh, in the last several years. Uh, as a component of this thalamic fasciculus. Now, taking all of that and distilling it into um, a movie here. And it moves a little quickly, but you can come back when this uh, lecture is uploaded onto our YouTube station when you get back home and you can stop it and start it and um, use it as necessary. So there's our th thalamus. There's some of our subnuclei. We uh, cut the thalamus up. We see the multiple uh, subnuclei. We see what's the main uh, components that are coming into it. So I'll stop there. And you see, for example, the ventral trigeminal thalamic tract, which is a crossed or uncrossed tract. Mostly a cross tract, so mostly from the contralateral side of the body, comes up to the VPM. Uh, some others, we see the dentato rubrothalamic tract. Uh, GPI projecting to the VL. Uh, VA, we mentioned the GP projects there, but the substantia nigra also uh, comes to this VA nucleus. Uh, the anterior nucleus gets, as we mentioned, in PAPE circuitry, the mammalothalamic tract, but also gets some direct hippocampal fibers that go there. We see uh, for the lateral dorsal, the hippocampus and superior colliculus, those are two major um, fiber bundles that arise here. Uh, medial dorsal, which uh, again has uh, stirred a lot of interest recently with uh, deep brain stimulation, gets amygdala and superior colliculus. We see lateral posterior is parietal lobe, superior colliculus, and I think uh, we mentioned the others. So here are some projection sites uh, to the cortex from these different areas of the thalamus. You can kind of follow the arrows up, and it's just as we had in the earlier descriptive slide showing uh, where. Uh, on the neocortex, these areas are going to be represented. And then remember, those same areas are going to, in general, are going to project back to the same area that they were projected from. Uh, somatotopic representation. Uh, this is not as well understood as when you look at the cortex uh, and you look at the homunculus of where different things are represented. Uh, this is a rough drawing. It's difficult to come up with drawings of somatotopic representation of the thalamus. This is one from Hassel's textbook, which is a bit antiquated now. But it shows you, in general, most of these thalamic nuclei have head medial and uh, lower extremities lateral. Uh, and you can use the reference there of the internal capsule and then the, the caudate more laterally. And uh, in the last few slides, we'll just look at more specifically at the arterial supply of the thalamus. So we have various origins of this. The PCA, right, gives perforators, thalamogeniculate arteries, posterior choroidals. Uh, 
PECOM, thalamoperforators, angiocoroidal can contribute to especially the lateral aspect of the thalamus when it is innervating, or not innervating, when it is supplying the internal capsule, which is just adjacent to it. There's two snapshots in, uh, from posterior cerebral. We see those posterior choroidals, the geniculothalamates, uh, a posterior view of those uh, vessels. Uh, one structure that sneaks on the board sometimes is uh, one of the thalamoperforators from your P1 segment, which is shown here. Um, and if you don't have a contralateral one of those, then this combined stem is called the artery of Percheron, and that artery will supply both thalami. Uh, this is a artery of Percheron from our lab, just off of the P1 segment here. And sometimes you may see that picture. So bithalamic uh, infarctions uh, is indicative, usually, of a, a presence of an artery of Percheron. Last slide just gives you some of the more generic uh, thalamic syndromes that occur. Uh, you can have a posterior lateral thalamus syndrome, which obviously is going to have sensory issues as a main component. Um, there can be speech issues. Remember we talked about the, um, well, we didn't talk about it. There can be speech issues, and that's not fully understood. The one that's usually most commonly referred to is the pain syndrome of uh, Dejere and Rusi, um, and that's usually involving the VP nucleus. Medial thalamic syndromes. Uh, you can have disorders of consciousness, so a discrete lesion in the thalamus can result in conscious uh, issues, and that's thought to be by disruption of those reticular nuclei that are resting at the top of the reticular activating system chain. Uh, thalamic neglect, thalamic amnesia, akinetic mutism, those are all part of the medial thalamic syndrome. And then finally, anterolateral thalamic syndrome, uh, paresis, ataxia, motor and coordination, uh, those are all parts and can either be there or not or all together at the same time. So that's a quick uh, tour of the ventral and dorsal thalami, and uh, I'll uh, be glad to answer any questions for you. Mm -hmm.